So firstly, I just want to say hi to everyone. Um, it's lovely to see everyone here um, and welcome to our STEM panel this evening. Um, firstly, I just wanted to ask the speakers, is it okay if we record the session um, just for future purposes in case anyone wants to go back on the recording? Sure. Yep, perfect, okay. So my name is Claudia and I'm the Vice President of the Queen Mary Non-Law Aspiring Lawyer Society. Um, and we are very happy to be able to host this panel in collaboration with the Bar Society and the Biomedical Engineering Society. We have Lika, who is the Events Officer for the Bar Society, and she'll be asking the questions today. Just as sort of housekeeping, can I please ask that all of your microphones are muted during the talk? Um, and also, if you have any questions during the talk, just feel free to put them into the chat box and we will try to answer them at the end if we have time. So to introduce all of our panellists for this evening, we have Dr. Justin Turner QC, Thomas Lunt and Charles Barbin, all of whom are from Three News Square. And so if we're ready, would the panellists like to give a short introduction of themselves? Justin, you're on mute. I was just going to suggest Thomas went first. Oh, sure. Um, evening, everyone. My name's Thomas. I'm the most junior tenant at Three New Square, having just accepted a place tenancy uh, last month. Uh, so I've had my one year's pupillage that preceded that. Uh, my background, I'm sure we'll come on to in, in a bit more detail later, uh, was in chemistry. Um, I had the opportunity of doing research masters uh, as well. Uh, and then it was the GDL and Barkos route uh, through to pupillage for me. I'll say hello, uh, Charles. I'm not quite the most junior, but not far away either. Um, I had a science background too uh, before coming to IP. I studied biology, biological sciences, undergrad, and then a PhD in genetics, biochemistry. And I think uh, this, is, this is just coming to the end of the third year of tenancy. So I'm, I'm Justin, I, I um, joined Chambers in 1992, so I'm right at the other end. Um, uh, and um, I was a lifetime ago a scientist of sorts. I was a vet veterinarian and then um, an immunologist. And I've been doing sort of mostly patent law since I joined, mostly. Great, thank you. I think we can dive in into our first question. Um, I think we would be grateful if you could talk us uh, through your journey to the bar and in particular, what persuaded you to leave Sam and join the bar? Thomas, do you wish we did in the same order? Sure, absolutely. Um, so yeah, what persuaded me to leave the bar? I mentioned a moment ago that I, I did a research master's of my fourth year at university. Um, and that, that would have counted if I'd gone on for the, the first year of a, of a DFED or a PhD. Uh, and it was during that year that I discovered I'm too impatient to go ahead with uh, the uh, academic side of science. Because um, I still had a year or so of you know, failed attempts in the lab, uh, cooking things up for fortnights at a time and then finding that they didn't quite turn out properly. Uh, and so I, I thought I'd like to keep some of the, you know, the science aspects uh, and some of the chemistry I've been learning over the last three or four years, um, but something that was a little bit faster paced. Charles? Um, I, I, I feel sometimes like I'm one of the few people that really enjoyed science. Um, often you hear lots of horror stories. I, I really enjoyed my time in the lab and I, I miss it. Um, at the same time, I suppose it was a combination of pushes and pulls. Um, you will all be familiar with the, the, the way careers in science work. I found that um, instability quite frustrating. You might say, well, why have you gone and become self-employed? And we can talk about that later, I guess. Um, and, and also one of the things about science is as you progress up and move towards being a lab head if, if you manage to do that you often lose the science that you really enjoy and I saw the bar and specifically IP work as a way to um, retain some of uh, the science that I enjoyed doing maybe not the specifics 
um, but uh, the the ability to to really get into the details of a a sciencey case, and and to do that in a way where you've got a degree of independence about your work, and we might get onto this, but um, it, it, because you're self-employed, it, it's it's very different in some ways to being um, a solicitor in, in good ways and and bad ways, and um, that together with the the subject material. Um, that was a, a, an attraction to me. So a combination of reasons not to stay in science and, and reasons to go to the bar. So, so I'm, I'm not sure my experience would be particularly useful because it was really embarrassment that brought me to the bar. I had, um, uh, in the 1960s, there was this, this television programme, some of your parents may have known it, about a, uh, uh, a group of people who flew around a game park, sort of darting animals and rescuing lions trapped with thorns in their feet I think. and and I thought this was this just the one that would be the way to live and uh, so my career had been very much ge geared to sort of doing tropical disease and indeed I to some extent achieved this that I was in the uh, Serengeti game reserve for a few months flying around in a plane doing all those things that I'd seen in the 1960s and um, uh, and then I, I, I realized that actually that was quite lonely um, I didn't have a social life and if you move back, you know, into Nairobi or, or Dar es Salaam, you, you realise that, you know, African people really don't want white people doing stuff in their countries. I mean, they may tolerate it, but they really don't want it. And, and, and why should they, uh, given the history of these countries? Um, so uh, I, I was back in Cambridge just for a few months and I had dinner with an um, undergraduate who was um, about to go to the bar. So he was a law undergraduate. And... Um, uh, we got quite sort of, you know, we had a, a good dinner and a few bottles of wine. And um, he, he, at about midnight, he said, well, what are you, you know, what are your plans? And I said, well, there's a bit of a dilemma that I, you know, there were disadvantages to working in Africa and I had these other possibilities at universities in the UK. And so what would you do in my position? And he was enormously enthusiastic about the bar. And he said, well, I would become a barrister. It's just the best job. And these are the reasons. And... Um, so, you know, by two in the morning after another bottle of wine, this was like the best idea ever. And um, I woke up the next morning and gave it not a moment's thought. And he'd explained to me the courses you could do on, go on. And he explained to me that, that scientists can have a role in law, particularly patent law, he said. And um, as I say, I, I, I gave it no thought. And it was July, I think. And he said there was a course starting in September. You probably could muscle your way onto it with a bit of luck and um three days later i i bumped into him in cambridge and he bounced up to me with uh, enthusiasm and said so justin did you you know did you enroll on the course have you spoken to this person have you done all those things you promised you'd do at two o'clock in the morning on, on saturday night and i said um no i haven't and he looked so disappointed and crestfallen that i uh left him and walked up the road and passed Cambridge um, Careers Office and thought, well, you know, I've got, I'm not really doing anything. I'll pop in and uh, so sort of sat in front of somebody and they picked up the phone and then said, right, you have an appointment to meet a barrister, Biffo Squeakins in the temple tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. And uh, so I, I knew nothing about the bar at all. I'd never walked into a courtroom. I didn't know anything uh, about being a barrister didn't know anything about law, um, but I discovered you could enrol on this course and do a month, and uh, if you didn't like it, you could get the fees back. So I, uh, October, I could do that. So that's what I did. I enrolled on the course, and then I found law actually sort of quite interesting, and it was quite a luxury to be sitting in a lecture theatre again after uh, a few years of, of a more onerous science. Um, and um, so that, you know, so I really did it with very little thought. It was just really by chance. But uh, um, similar to Thomas, I, I, I did find I wasn't, although I enjoyed science, I was really rubbish in the lab. I really was. I used to pretend to myself I wasn't, but I don't have that, that patience um, to perform biological experiments carefully and consistently. And I was never going to be, I thought, and that was probably a fair assessment, never going to be a good experimental scientist. Um. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that, this with us. 
And for those of us who are not as familiar with the process as we would like to be, could you please highlight uh, the general path students with the STEM degree have to embark on to become a barrister? Should I take this on as well? Because I think I've done it most yeah, recently. Charles, you're the most recent. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think everyone knows the, the, the general format. Um, you know, you've got the luxury of having already done an undergraduate degree that you can jump in at the GDL level. Uh, so you don't have to go and do a, a three-year LLB, uh, although some people might choose to anyway. Um, there's a number of course providers that will offer the GDL. Uh, I went to BPP in Birmingham, uh, but I know they also have uh, offices in London, and I think other regional outlets as well. Uh, I think City University is still running. I think ULaw is the other main provider. Um, I'd say in choosing between them, the reason I chose BPP is that they happen to have the best scholarship on, on offer. Um, so, you know, if you're able to get some sort of financial discount from one of them, uh, I don't think there's a huge difference between the uh, providers, and I haven't heard anybody uh, indicate that there is. So certainly I think it's, it's really a financial decision for you. Um, the only advantage I'd say, sorry, sorry, I then stayed with BPP Birmingham where I did my bar course as well. Uh, the advantage of doing it in Birmingham is that it was a slightly smaller cohort. So we had, I think, 50 or 60 students rather than about 200 or so that I know some of the, the London providers have. Um, for me, I found that that meant I got to know the tutors better. And I think you get a, a better quality teaching when it comes to some aspects of, say, the advocacy because they really know you personally and from, you know, week to week, one to, um, from week to week, they can um, understand and memorise more easily how your, your, your progress has, has been going. Um, I should also say that both the GDL and the bar course can be offered on full-time or part-time bases. So I know many people having done an undergraduate degree already would like to be able to do those part-time and work alongside them. Uh, and you can also, you know, you can use that just, just to, um, you know, just a bit of money or to try and gain some experience you think might be relevant uh, to a career at the bar. Uh, for, for me, I, I did both of those just, just back to back full time for two years. Uh, and I then applied for pupillage in my bar course year uh, and had a year in between the bar course and starting pupillage where I, I worked um, for half a year at some solicitors. Uh, I think the last aspect is to mention is there's uh, the process of dining, uh, and that still exists. Um, so you, you have to join an inner court at some point. And I think you have to do 12 hours or so of uh, certified activities that are meant to have an educational aspect to them and, and also a social one. So you get to meet other barristers or benches of the inn uh, and can have these sorts of discussions <laughs> with them. And I think once you've done those three parts, you can then be called to the bar uh, and then have a look for pupillage. I just add, I think, um, certainly from my experience, which admittedly was a long time ago, I, I think doing the um, academic year, which is the first year part time while trying to do something else, is, would be quite challenging. I think the second year would probably be easier to do part time. Charles, I don't know how that reflects with your. I, uh, personally, I'd struggle to do anything else for both years, um, but. but... Certainly the first year is, is, is very intense. I think that was the, the next thing we were going to come on, on to. It's, uh, but I found both years to be, be quite full on. So since you mentioned the GDL, uh, we would like to know how did you approach it and whether there were any major obstacles that you faced in transitioning to a completely new style of studying? Thomas? Sorry, I didn't know if you wanted to carry on. And Were you on a, on a train of thought a moment ago? Uh, I, can, I can carry on with my train of thought then. Um, yeah, GDL, uh, having, having been doing a PhD, I did find it quite a shock to go back to being in class. Um, Justin sees it as a luxury. I, I <laughs> didn't <laughs> feel it at the time. Um, and I don't mean that in a, a pride sense, but essentially you go from knowing an awful lot about your area with a PhD, maybe more than anyone else, uh, to starting from scratch and, and getting things wrong. And that can be quite a demoralizing process, uh, but you just have to remember that everyone is in the same boat. And one other point which I, I got wrong and, and, I'm mentioning it so you don't, 
is I think in science, especially if you've done a, a, a second degree, you're used to coming across, say, papers, and, and this applies to undergrad as well, I think, and, and reading that paper and going into a lot of detail. And then you come to the GDL and you've got to cover law generally in a year. There are loads of case references. And my instinct was to read every one because they're sort of interesting. You know, you haven't done law before and all these different sorts of cases. And apart from that, you think, well, I have to know all the detail for, for the essay or exams. But actually, there just isn't time. Or there wasn't time for me, definitely. And I think that was a, a common experience. There isn't time to do that. They give you case references for you to remember uh, together with a small number of facts about that case. And that's all you need when it comes to exam time. And, and if you try and get into the detail of everything, it's it's a nightmare because there's only so much you can fit into a year. And, and the GDL is, it is quite superficial um, in, in terms of what you have capacity to take in. I, I, I mean, I think it's quite, something I found it quite an interesting year um, just because it's, um, I, I'm not sure law is really very suited to a degree. Um, uh, um, if you do a law degree, you're doing, you know, you do a, a course in land law and then you do a course on company law and then a course on another aspect of law. Uh, and it, you just sort of pile them on top of each other. And I, I think actually, although it's quite an intense year, I think uh, law deserves a year of intense academic study. I'm not sure it really deserves three years of study as an academic subject. So uh, personally, I think it's actually quite a good way of studying law. Um, and you do the six core subjects that you do um, do give you a foundation to go on and do the other subjects if you wish to sort of specialise in them. So um, generally, you know, teenagers coming through, I was, uh, I think if they've got an interest in something else, I would discourage no one from doing it the way you're potentially doing it, having a science degree and, and then a law degree. I don't think it's second best at all. And uh, the, 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 the bar has always had this route and a lot of really famous judges and famous lawyers actually went that route. So the president of the Supreme Court um, was a, uh, a chemist. Um, Lord Denning was a mathematician. Um, you know, that's a, it's a really well-established route through to, to success. I certainly say also that my experience was quite similar to something that Charles said, in that it's quite scary going from an area that you know quite a bit about to having to start completely from scratch again. Um, I don't really have any advice to share about that, although I suppose by the same token, because it's only a year long, then by the end of it, it's over quite quickly. Uh, and by the end of it, you, you know quite a bit about law, so it's all okay again. Um, one big difference between science and law is that whereas you know, science exists independent of, of humans, it just exists in nature, and if it were to be discovered again, it would arise in the same fashion. Um, law is man-made, and so there are you know, sort of uh, wrinkles in it that one wouldn't have expected uh, and aspects that you'd have to learn. So whereas, with, you know, with chemistry or other physical sciences, if you know your basics, you can then derive much more of the subject. With law, it doesn't always carry over in the same way uh, in that you can't always predict exactly where the case law is going to go. And I think from, from a learning angle, that made a big difference to me uh, because I couldn't just rely on the, the basic principles and figure anything else out that I needed to in the exam. Uh, but actually, as Charles says, you need to go into the detail and as much of it as you can in a relatively compressed time frame uh, and just do a lot of learning. Um, so what would you say are the major advantages that a student with a STEM background could expect while transitioning to the legal profession? And likewise, the major obstacles that STEM students face. So, so I mean, I think, um, uh, so law is a sort of uh, a neutral skill, which then has to be applied to things. <laughs> applied, I mean, it could be applied as in, in, the, in the context of litigation, be applied in the context of working within a company. Um, and um, uh, a lot of disputes are 
uh, are scientific and have a scientific background. And I'm very critical of my, having worked with many of them, I'm very critical of a lot of non-scientific lawyers who, who, who never really roll their sleeves up and understand uh, uh, about um, the subject matter of, of the dispute and fight shy of it and um, uh, approach, they get experts involved and they really treat the experts as words as sort of, you know, gospel or as pieces of text and don't critically appraise them and get underneath them. So uh, if I give an example, so patent lawyer is famous for being, you know, the lawyers being very scientific and rolling up their sleeves, but I give an example from something else. So uh, someone I qualified with happened to have a PhD in engineering didn't want to go into a science area of law, went into judicial review, so reviewing decisions of government, and got involved in a planning dispute. And it was about storing nuclear waste in, in, the, uh, in the Lake District, uh, in, in a piece of rock, many, many hundreds of metres under the ground. And um, as a very junior barrister, you know, the, 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 all the time and all the evidence was about what were the scientific consequences of having nuclear waste in this in this rock, and um, he, 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 as he explained to me one one day, he says, says more was known about this piece of rock than any other piece of rock in the world, and, and all that was technical in, information. So obviously, somebody with a, a STEM background who's not who's not af afraid of reading science and saying, well, I don't understand that. Can you explain that to me? It is in a really good position. And, and some non-lawyers are like that. Some non-scientists, sorry, are, are like that, but very, very few. Um, uh, um, so I think it's like uh, super useful. And if you have, you know, uh, uh, an, an accident at sea or have an oil pipeline that disintegrates or a plane that crashes, all the, the subject matter of all these things is highly technical. And having that as an extra string to your bow, I think makes the work a lot more, a lot more satisfying and makes you a, a lot of use to, to, to the dispute or the advice that you're giving. Um, so that will be my, um, so I do think there are huge benefits. In, in terms of challenges, I mean, I don't think, um, I think that was the other aspect of your question, uh, obstacles. I, I don't think there are any uh, obstacles at all. I think there's a little bit of, you know, some, some people who are very mathematically orientated may be actually quite bad at writing and expressing themselves. So some people may find law doesn't suit their way of thinking, but I would expect that to be a minority of people, not a majority. And that's probably true of a minority of people who've got an English degree, a minority of people who've got a history degree, and probably a minority of people who enrol in law at university. So, so you know, 20 or 30 percent might might find law quite challenging uh, or more challenging than, than, than most lawyers. And um, um, but I don't think having done a STEM subject would make you more likely to be in that category. Um, uh, Thomas, I don't know if you agree with that or you've got a different view. No, absolutely. I agree. I agree entirely. I mean, I think, you know, coming on to the question of what obstacles there are, the options, it seems to me, is either do a law degree and then go and become a lawyer or do a science degree and then a law degree in short form and then go and be a lawyer. And it seems that having what you're going to have anyway, plus also a science degree, can't in any way harm you. Um, and, and as Justin said, there are many disputes, you know, not just those that crop up solely in the field of uh, pharmaceutical patterns, but also in oil or planes or planning um, that can be assisted by having a technical understanding. I have to say, sometimes I have come across a topic, uh, a legal topic, non-IP and I've thought I wonder if I'd done a three-year degree uh, would I be more comfortable with that uh, I suppose the consequence of not being comfortable is I have to spend a few hours uh, reading up about it and that's outweighed by all the benefits that, that the science background bring uh, and I think apart from the training in applying an analytical approach STEM people tend to have an interest in that kind of thing, tend to enjoy getting into the details of a case. So not only can you do it, but it's likely to be more interesting to you. Thank you. Um, so I think the next question is very important. 
and interesting topic of conversation. When you entered your legal uh, workplace, did you or any of your colleagues with a STEM background experience imposter, sy imposter syndrome? And how would you advise on overcoming any alienation? Sorry, could you say that again, Lika? I just lost you for a minute. Oh, sorry. Um, the question is whether when you entered the legal workplace, you or any of your co colleagues um, experienced imposter syn syndrome? Oh, yeah. And how would you advise on uh, overcoming any alienation? Um, Charles, do you want to? Okay. Uh, I'd say uh, yes, but nothing to do with my STEM background. It's just, it can be quite intimidating starting in a new area. Uh, and actually, I'd say, really, as a STEM person in IP, you should feel very at home. It's very common to have uh, people with STEM backgrounds. If you look at, for example, number three, uh, our chambers, um, I think the majority of at least the junior end of chambers have science background or, or, or STEM backgrounds in, in one form of another. And, and anyway, I, I found the bar, the IP bar, to be a very friendly place. Uh, people aren't looking to point out differences or score points. Um, it's a funny one because everyone is your competitor. So you would expect, or everyone at the same level is your competitor. So you, you would expect that to be there perhaps, but um, my experience is that it isn't. And also if you, if you look at the judges uh, in IP, they, or at least a lot of them, come from science backgrounds. So there isn't really, I don't think, a, a good basis for, for feeling you're out of place. And again, it goes, goes back to this thing that there's, it's always been, it's ever been the case that um, uh, people have different backgrounds. So, you know, a lot of the judges will have classics degrees, um, history degrees, and, you know, what, there's no reason to distinguish between what your background is and your ability to be a lawyer. And I, I just think that's in the core of the bar and always has been. So I, I, I don't think that's an issue at all. I, I agree with Charles that the bar's quite an intimidating place to arrive at. Um, um, but um, um, perhaps less so than when I started. So when I, when I started, I mean, to give an idea how extreme it was, I sat in a meeting. So I had a PhD in immunology so, you know, knew a fair bit about immunology, done a couple of years post doc and, um, uh, and I, I sat in a meeting where everyone was discussing what an epitope is on, a, on, a, on, a, on an antigen, which is sort of, you know, week one of immunology undergraduate. And no one asked, asked me, and I, I was just, you know, and they were speculating wildly as to what an epitope was. And I after 45 minutes, I spoke up and said, well, I, I think, you know, very politely. And I got a terrible ticking off for interrupting everyone. In that time. Just for the contrast on, on that point, there was a case that Justin and I were involved in back in March. And I, there we were drafting, it was the fourth expert report of uh, Dr. Barley. Um, and he happened to be our medicinal chemist and my background's in chemistry. And my pupil master at the time, and also the instructing solicitor who I happened to work with previously, um, we're all very happy for me to, you know, share my thoughts about uh, what I thought about this six-membered pie ring um, and and the way in which that could be incorporated into our into our case. Um, so fortunately, things have moved on a little bit. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. The other thing we've spoken a bit about, you know, things at the junior end of the bar, but but also I'd just say that if you come from a STEM background, then by definition you're going to go on to the GDL, and everybody there. Um, uh, has, has started that course afresh and they're all new to law. Uh, and likewise on the bar course, um, I don't know exactly, but you know, some very high percentage of people, um, certainly you know, at least 50-50, had come through that background too. Um, so it's not the case that having you know, left the world of STEM, you are suddenly cast adrift or left on an island by yourself. Um, there are lots of other people who do it as well uh, and you'll, you'll find them along the way. So how do chambers perceive those who have a degree uh, in a discipline other than law, uh, as opposed to those who have an undergraduate in law? Would you say it's different or the same? 
No, I'd say it's uh, certainly in an I I IP set, it would be, the prejudice would be, if insofar as there is one, would be in favour of the people with the scientific background. Okay. Um, so, um, other areas of law, I I've never, occasionally judge it. I mean, 20 years ago, occasionally people would say, there are some benefits to having a law degree, but really rarely, and, and only a few people. So I, I just don't see that as an issue at all. And considering your personal experience, what would you say are the most transferable skills for STEM students aiming to pursue law? Well, I think, I, I, I think um, you know, the ability to critically appraise something and whether it's the reasoning in a paper, a passage in a textbook, and, and that, that ability for critical appraisal and care um, it is something that sort of tracks across a lot of disciplines. So, you know, maybe a good historian will be good at that, or a, a good English student will be good at that, and a good scientist will be good at that. Uh, um, so, uh, um, I'd say that was probably the, the, the key thing in, 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 in uh, young lawyers that if, if I was critical of them, and it doesn't include those here today, if I was critical of them, it's that perhaps they're not reading things with and thinking about things carefully enough. Um, but that's not a, you know, that, that wouldn't apply to science students any more than anyone else. So, so, so that skill I think is, is important. Um, I think as you become, thoroughly familiar with a, a subject area, there then is the possibility of thinking creatively. And I think some people think more creatively than others, perhaps, are more likely to sort of join dots across. And that's, of course, incredibly important in science um, uh, as well. And I think that can be a useful skill in law, saying, you know, why haven't we thought of this argument? And, you know, everyone has been saying, this in the following chain of cases. Why, why aren't they saying something else? And is there actually a reason or has it just become a, a, a sort of habit? Um, uh, so that, that's a skill that can be useful and certainly that's a skill that scientists can have. But I mean, I don't think you can get to that stage really until you've got a good grounding in the subject. Um, uh, um, uh, and it's only when you, you, you know where all the dots are that you can start trying to join them in creative ways. Charles, do you have any thoughts on that? There's one one thing that um, that I I thought might be useful, and which I thought I developed a bit during science was the ability to to communicate what I was doing in science, which is it's relatively complex. But by the time you well whatever level you're at, really, it can be relatively complex, and to be able to communicate something of that level of complexity to, on the one hand, someone who doesn't know much about the topic, and on the other hand, someone who knows all the details and is going to argue about them and pick you up and you have to defend your position. So I suppose being, being able to communicate complex ideas to a range of, of audiences, whether it's your client who may know a lot or a little, or the expert, or, or ultimately the judge, um, that ends up being quite useful. And if you can practice it at the stage while you're doing science, it'll come in very handy later on. Um, so there is no denying, obviously, that the legal sector can be very challenging. Um, could you please share some personal anecdotes that you think every student should be aware of? Uh, there was a thought I had just based on something Justin said a moment ago, which was about joining dots. Uh, and I realised I, I said at the start of the talk about a different learning style that you have between at least the physical sciences and law, in that one of them you can you know, derive from maths, sort of, uh, and at the other end, I, maybe I painted it too much that law is just created on the, the, the whims of indi individual judges. Um, but I, I suppose that, that's the, the perception I had when I was learning law and when I was on the GDL that you come across each of the dots individually and you have to learn them as, as a one-off fact, trying to you know, extract the ratio from this judgment. But nonetheless, it's only one point that you get on what you're trying to plot as a big graph. 
Um, I think at some point, what, one, one of the challenges is making that leap from the individual dots themselves to deriving your own conjecture about the way in which you think this area of law works and what the framework is trying to achieve as a matter of you know, policy or justice or fairness. I mean, give me the question again, Leek. Yes, so you know, sir, that the legal sector can be very challenging. So we would like to know about personal anecdotes that every student should know in your opinion. Well, I, I think we've all, we've all had like crushingly embarrassing moments and they probably seem more embarrassing to us than they do to other people. And uh, one of the, I'll tell you an anecdote, but one of the observations I have is that um, when young barristers go into court, and particularly when they come back and talk to each other, and, and Charles and Thomas can tell me this is nonsense. When they come back and talk to each other, they say, it's nonsense, how did yeah. it go? How did it go? And the other barrister go, no, no, I think, you know, I think my client was happy and the judge, the judge didn't think I was too much of an idiot. And it's all about them. Okay. So, so, you know, it's, it's a bit like a doctor saying, yes, my, you know, that stitch was fantastic. You know, I did that really well without referring to the health of the patients. Uh, and there is a tendency, and this is not a, a criticism of, uh, 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 of people. I, I think it's it's it shows more about our nature. It's a tendency to think that the process is about us, and the process really isn't about us. The process that's going on is about someone else, your client, and uh, and we we the, the, the things are embarrassing because we think that everyone is looking at us all the time, and, and they're really not. And if you're a young barrister, people don't expect you to be as good as a senior barrister. I mean, they just don't. Okay. And, uh, and you know, providing you don't make a complete idiot of yourself, which you won't, nobody's really interested in that. But I had, a, I had an experience where um, uh, I just finished my pupillage and there was this enormous piece of litigation going on, hugely important case, billions at stake, even when I started back in 92, and a hearing came in in the... Um, summer holidays and I was the only person around and I had to go to court and I thought I did the hearing okay in the circumstances I was fairly happy but we then got a letter a week later saying that I had said something which indicated that there was a major conspiracy um, in the litigation and uh, so all my personal notes had then to be scrutinized I had to deliver them up, incoherent, legally inaccurate, um, ungrammatical, had, was studied by teams of lawyers, including uh, an eminent judge. And I just, I just wanted to die, you know, because even on the face of them, they were just ridiculous notes. Uh, uh, yeah, it was the most horrible experience. And I was just thinking, what is this judge, this really important judge who used to be a member of my chambers? And, you know, what does he think of me? And of course, he just, you know, he didn't care at all. It was just, you know, everyone's notes are pretty rubbish. But I mean, it was just toe curlingly embarrassing. I think, I think when you, when you start, because you haven't, if you like, you haven't achieved anything positive, you've got no basis for being confident, you're constantly worried, or at least I'm, I'm well, I was, I probably still am, constantly worried about how, how you're perceived. And maybe that comes back to what Justin's saying about what you say after a hearing. Uh, but especially during pupillage, it's a year of assessment, and, and you are concerned about what everyone thinks of you. And... Uh, I was thinking about um, this issue ahead of the talk and I remembered during pupillage I was sitting with one supervisor who had something in the Court of Appeal and it was about inhalers and he had uh, two samples. It was a trademark case about colour marks and he had a, a white version and then he had a version with the the colours on it and he gave me a task and it was a nice task because nothing could go wrong with it it wasn't a legal task he said 
Charles, can you can you just just get the label off these? And so I, I went off to the kitchen and the white one, no problem, the label just peeled off. And the colour one, I just couldn't, I couldn't get this label off. And it was so frustrating because it was such a simple task. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe a bit of steam from the kettle will help. So I did that and, and that, that didn't do the job. And a bit more and that didn't do the job. So I thought, well, maybe I could, and this is, this is creativity coming in. I, I could prop this inhaler over the open kettle and just leave it for a bit. And, and I did that and I came back and it had changed colour. And, 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 and the whole case was about the colour of this thing. And I, I went downstairs and uh, opened the door. I was really panicking at that stage. And, and I said, I, I've got a little problem. And um, this was Simon Malinich, QC, who's, who's quite good at what he does. And um, he looked at me like, like my dad looks at me when I've done something wrong. You know, there's, there's an element of fear about what it might be. And he was actually very forgiving, but it's the sort of thing where in pupillage, you, you really don't want to get into that situation, but they still took me on. Um, one, one thing it might be worth mentioning is, is obviously there's a, uh, a lot of scientists, because scientists are often sort of quite modest people, that they're, 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 you may feel that you're not very good about talking in public or that's an aspect that's concerning you. Um, uh, maybe because you haven't had a lot of experience at it or when you have done it, you perhaps have been nervous and not as confident as you imagine barristers must be. I, I really wouldn't worry about that at all. Um, I'm not a, not a good advocate, uh, certainly not naturally a good advocate. It is something that you learn. And, and what I'd be asking myself in your situation is, am I quite good at talking to my friends can I tell them an anecdote in the pub? Can I, you know, am, am I good at explaining things to other students? And, and if you're reasonably good at that, you don't have to be exceptional at that. If you're reasonably good at that, then that's going to be a sufficient base on, on which to work. It really will. And I, 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 far more important is not the eloquence with which you say things. I mean, that's what the telly tells us barristers do. They're very eloquent, but that's not really true. What's important is being accurate knowing the story so that you can tell it to the judge um, and not saying inaccurate things and not, not misjudging the situation, bringing the right points to the fore. Um, um, and I really think it's, you know, there are a lot of really top barristers who frankly are just painful to listen to in, in terms of sheer ability to present themselves. Um, Thomas, you speak very well, I think, for a young man. Do you, do you, would you agree with that? Yeah, no, I mean, in terms of sort of my history, I had very little public speaking experience. And I think I got involved in third year in the debating society at, at my university. And that, that was my first real outing. So, you know, once a week, I'd have a debate in front of a room of seven other people. So, I mean, it's still, you know, it's not terribly frequent. It's not a huge class, of, you know, crowd of people. Um, but that, you know, that was the first go I had at public speaking. And that's... Well, I say, you, you speak very confidently, as everyone can observe, just listening to this. I'm just asking you about your observations on other barristers, quite successful barristers. You wouldn't say that they were all eloquent, would you, or they're all... No, I mean, uh, I certainly think that, yes, presenting a point confidently and with conviction is more important than having that delightful turn of phrase that just, you know, trots out and makes you sound fantastic. And I think the, the confidence and conviction comes, as Justin says, from knowing what the story is that your, your client wants to present and knowing where their uh, sort of emotional stance lies and how that's going to interact with the tribunal you're in front of. So, you know, pitching the temperature of your, your case appropriately uh, is, is one of the things that fall, falls in, into that line. And it doesn't really matter the way in which you do it, you know, the particular words you're using, um, but but rather you you convey so much more through the the your body language and your temperament and and your um, you know the, the stress you put on words and the style in which you speak. It's also it's also quite a personal thing. So um, there are some judges I appear in front of, and you know I click with them. I know what to say. I know what they're likely to be thinking um, because we think in similar ways. And um, 
bit like some people you find it very easy to become friends with because you're like-minded, perhaps. Um, and some judges are always a challenge um, because they've got to, they see the world very differently or, or you may feel they go off on tangents or they think you go off on tangents or whatever. So, so, so there is a, you know, there's a, a lot of variety in terms of judges. There's lots of variety in terms of advocates. Some will click. There was one, uh, our former head of chambers, uh, I won't say his name, but he really was the worst public speaker one could imagine. I mean, he, I couldn't understand anything he said. And yet there was one judge in particular, he only had to start a half garbled sentence and the judge would finish it for you. I mean, they were completely uh, simpatico. So, so all, all, all forces for courses, I think. Great, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And our next question is, why do you think many uh, barristers with a STEM background venture into intellectual property? And also, would you agree with the notion that IP law is the natural home for barristers with a science-based background? Okay, so, so for, for my part, I, I, I mean, IP is the, is, is the easy option. So I didn't have, you know, I didn't have a double first from Oxford, I didn't have, well, you know, I, I failed a bunch of O levels. I, I didn't have a good CV at all, except I'd, I'd done some quite good science. So um, it's an it's an easy thing. I can, you know, I can go to an IP set and say, look, I've got something to offer. Uh, if I'd gone to a commercial set, I, I wouldn't have got in through the door. I think even for an interview. So so that's. But that's the reason. Um, but I would discourage people from only looking at IP. I think IP is quite an interesting area of law because it's a very old area of law. It developed in the UK and in Germany, goes back to the Industrial Revolution in recognisable form. And um, so therefore, it's quite a complex area of law, which makes it quite interesting once you get over the, the learning hurdle. Uh, there are quite a lot of tensions um, in in uh, IP cases, there's quite a lot of learning to get your teeth into, um, and the science definitely is a mostly a prerequisite for, for a lot of people. But you know, I, I, I think other areas of of law are um, amenable to people with scientific backgrounds. So uh, I would keep an open mind and would certainly put IP on the list, um, but I'd keep an open mind as to our other areas of law. Charles, any thoughts on... Yeah, I, I agree. I think you, you've got an advantage in the area, but it's really important to work out whether you like the subject material and whether that means trying to do mini pupillage or two, uh, having a look at some IP blogs or, or even going to court. Uh, one of the challenges of going to court without having all the skeletons is it's, it's hard to make sense of everything. Um, but... but just try and get a feel for it uh, together with other areas because ultimately I think these things are very personal and you just have to work out whether whether it does something for you. I'd really second that and particularly getting some sort of experience that you can with different areas of the law. Uh, Charles mentioned for example mini pupillages uh, and I did one up in Birmingham at a fan law set uh, and a couple in, in sort of more general commercial law as, as well as some IP ones. Um, and certainly for me, that kind of answers the question about the sorts of sets I'd like to apply to. Um, I, as I think, you know, we're all agreeing here is that science can help you getting into IP, although it's not, you know, it's not necessary if you have a uh, scientific aptitude, uh, but certainly it's not a bar to going elsewhere. And I think it's just a question for you about finding out uh, what it is you like. Great, thank you so much. I think now we have time to turn to our chat box and ask questions from there. And our first question is, would you say that the tech sector is looking resilient during this recession and patenting, licensing or copywriting looks as good as ever before? So, so, so um, it is said that um, certainly patent litigation, maybe IP litigation, is inversely related to the economy. I'm just saying it is said, I'm not sure I agree with this. So, so um, 
you know, when people are struggling for market share, um, they will often fight harder in patent litigation uh, to protect their markets. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that's true. In the, in the last recession, the 2008 recession, uh, work went quieter and um, it was said to companies, companies were just told, you've got to cut your litigation budget by 30% by management. We, we just don't care. And I think the bar can get squeezed because we're at the end of the food chain. Um, and it wasn't disastrous, but we definitely felt it. Um, this recession um, hasn't really got, got going yet. Um, um, I, it's won't be recession proof, but I think, you know, the general feeling is, I mean, you guys don't have to worry about this recession because by the time you, you get to join a set of chambers, hopefully by then it'll be over. Hopefully it'll be a few years. So, uh, um, but, but generally looking forward, leaving aside whether it's the bar or which of the professions you join, you'd have to say that IP is a growth area and an increasingly important area. So in terms of sitting here today saying which of the areas of law that probably will be active in 10 years time, you've got to put IP, I think, pretty high up. Um, you know, we can't predict things, but um, so I, I wouldn't have that as a major concern. What will happen next year if we have a major, major recession? I, I, I don't know. We'll, we will get pinched, I expect, like everybody else. That would be my view. Would other panelists like to share their view? Um, I was going to defer to Justin on that one anyway, so I'm glad he answered first. And I'll defer to Charles. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can move to our next question then. Um, do you have any advice for those uh, who are taking a module in intellectual property law? And does it require a different way of thinking, like equity and trust? I have to say, I didn't do a, an IP module. So I'm probably not the best person to ask. I mean, I, I would have thought, though, that really, to the extent there's a big difference, it'll it'll... It'll be in the facts that come with the cases rather than the law itself. Uh, you know, with a, with a patent case, at least my experience over the last few years, is that, that that's where the real complexity is. Uh, and and that's, that's where the science background really comes in. So my, my, my guess is that you, you just might not get a great feel from that when, when you're studying the law itself. So I, I, I disagree with Charles a little bit on this. So I think IP is really a very different way of thinking to other areas of law. What, what, I, what I, I doubt is whether you pick that up in an undergraduate course, um, uh, because it'll be relatively short. Um, you may pick something, I'm not, I'm not saying don't do it, but um, uh, I think it is the, perhaps the most fundamentally different area of law in terms of the way you think, which is why it's specialist. And when I get involved in IP cases, particularly things like misuse of confidential information with commercial lawyers, very eminent commercial lawyers, they have a completely different way of approaching it and thinking about it. And I would say a much inferior way of approaching it and thinking about it. And part of that is to do with the tensions in IP. So you're always balancing the infringement of an IP right with the validity of an IP right. And you're looking at both those things, and they are usually, in most cases, in considerable tension. Um, and uh, every every plaintiff, every claimant is a defendant, and every defendant is a claimant. So it's a area of law where balance is hugely important in the law, hugely important in the individual cases. Uh, and I think I think IP lawyers do have a, a very different way of looking at the world in areas of IP to other lawyers who just come to IP afresh. But I mean, you know, if, if people are thinking, do I take a module in intellectual property law? Um, if you're doing a one year course, it's obviously going to be, uh, I'm not even sure that would be an option unless you're doing a second year. I, I wouldn't really worry about that. Particularly, we all learned it on the job. 
if it's if it's on offer, by all means do it. But I, you know, I, I don't think it'll get you very far in terms of what you have to learn once you're on once you're within the professions. There's a there's a course, uh, and um, Thomas, I don't know if you've done it. Do you want to say something about the Bristol IP course? Sure. Know? I was going to say uh, firstly. Um, just even though you said you disagree with Charles somewhat, I find myself agreeing with with both of what you what you said. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I agree with Charles in that. So sorry, by way of my background, I did a, a short amount of IP law. I think it was on the bar course, and it was kind of bunged in at the second half of the third term or something like that. Um, and certainly, we didn't get onto anything technical uh, by way of subject matter at all. And I think as a result, we did nothing whatsoever on patents. Uh, and the aspects that we did on confidential information were all sort of employment type disputes and appropriating customer lists and that kind of thing, rather than taking uh, trade secrets with some technical value. Um, so I'd be interested, I mean, maybe Alexi, if you'd like to chime in, but uh, you know, to hear if you are doing some, some law of patterns and to what extent you have technical input on that. Um, ah, you, you're online, you could, you could tell me that. No, um, my someone was talking to me really quickly so I turned my camera off but um no I'm doing an intellectual property module now um and I find that it's quite different from what I observed on the mini um in the sense that in IP law it's exactly what um Justin said and you're just discussing the infringement and if it is IP and what's happening so I kind of put the question to the chat to ask do you have to change your thinking when approaching this topic um mainly because we're observing the Star Wars case right now with the sculpture or is it function or is it art and I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that to approach that topic sure um sorry I was, I was talking about patterns a moment to go the technical subject matter it sounds on a copyright dispute as though it's a slightly different focus of the course and and maybe indeed it is the case that you are not focusing so much on areas that require some technical input um, so that, that seems to seems to come true as well. And the other aspect of it that I was agreeing with on Justin's side of things is about the fact that in IP, you always have a tension between um, someone being able to establish a monopoly right, uh, but having to justify their ability um, to do that on the basis of some new uh, contribution that they've made. Uh, and the fact that if that right is established, they're going to be depriving members of the public from being able to operate in, in that area. Um, so I don't know, it sounds as though to some extent the, the kind of questions that you, you've just thrown up uh, would touch upon those sorts of areas about what is the public policy that's underlying the kind of copyright protection that we should allow people to have uh, and how exactly should we formulate as a matter of law um, the, the scope and definition of copyright uh, in, in order best to achieve the kind of you know, commercial and economic goals that the uh, system is sought to, to protect. And, and, and there are obviously qualified and unqualified IP rights. So the qualified IP rights are things like copyright, uh, which uh, uh, Lexi referred to, where, where there has to be an act of copying. Uh, so you have to have some relationship with, with the person who owns the monopoly right. You, you've been, you've, to infringe it, you have to engage with them, albeit inadvertently, perhaps, sort of quasi-inadvertently. But a patent right, just think how that's an unqualified right. Just how profound is that? I mean, I mean, think of an, somebody does something in Jakarta, and that affects what someone in Paris is entitled to do, or, or in London. Uh, um, and and th that's not an act of parliament. That's not a, that is just somebody filing a document can shut down your business, okay? Can shut down Jaguar Land Rover, someone filing a patent who's based in, in, in Jakarta. Uh, and so these are, they're really unusual things. And try and think of another area in society where the, the act of an individual can have such a profound, profound effect on your entitlement to do things. Um, so uh, that, that gives rise to the, you know, the importance of examining these monopoly rights. And they're, 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 they're granted in patent offices. So a, a, a patent will be examined by somebody who's probably 27 years old, no, no criticism of anyone in their 20s. Of course, you appreciate I'm just jealous. Um, but, but, you know, any 27 years old, been doing the job maybe for a couple of years. It's a wet Wednesday afternoon. Uh, um, they're not paying much attention. They examine the patent. Society deems we're not going to spend much money on this process because for every 100,000 patents that are filed, uh, only a handful are going to be of commercial importance, perhaps. So, so, so it, 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 it gets granted and examined. And then suddenly that turns out to be the one that is 
going to shut down Jaguar Land Rover, potentially. Uh, and, you know, then everyone sort of teams of lawyers descend on it and start going through it with the fine tooth comb. And they start being concerned about these balances of, of the entitlement to stop people doing, but, but is that entitlement going too far? Uh, and um, that, that's, you know, that's why sort of IP law it, it arises in strange circumstances to a lesser extent with copyright and trademarks, but still, still to a significant extent. Uh, um, so that's why it's sort of quite, quite a funny area of law to start off with. I, I, I mean, just adding, sorry, one I'm on a roll. Uh, um, in terms of how interesting IP law is um, as a dry subject, I mean, before I started studying, I did pick up the old textbook and it did seem to be quite dull. I, I did the LLM course on IP, which sort of raised these more philosophical issues, which I sort of found quite interesting at the level we're discussing now. Um, but um, in terms of sort of reading, trying to read a textbook on patent rights, I found it deadly dull. I mean, I think it's difficult when you approach it um, without sort of guidance of a lecturer who perhaps brings it to life. But it, you know, it does get more in, I think it's an area of law that the longer you study it, the more interesting it, it, it gets. So don't be surprised if you pick up um, Cornish on patents and read the introduction that you find it a bit dull. I, I wouldn't expect the same person <laughs> really to find it anything else. And other areas of law are more immediately accessible. And I think the complexity which makes it interesting perhaps requires a, a, a year or two of study before it starts, you know, starts coming to life. Charles, do you have any thoughts on that? Or did you find IP law fascinating when you first picked up the textbooks? No, I remember, I remember it was a very hot summer and before starting pupillage, I, I bought an IP textbook and not having done a module, I thought I, I was a bit behind and I, it was so hot, it was too hot to read it indoors. And I went out to a field and I sat under a tree and I was with the sheep at home and I, I was finding this book hard work. And one of the sheep came over and nibbled the end of it. And it, he also thought it was very dry and gave up. So we both, <laughs> we both had the same view. Now, I, I think when you're reading it in the abstract without actually doing the work, it can be quite hard going. Thank you. I think, uh, well, our next question is, what are the most important questions that Brexit introduces when it comes to trademark law? Right, I'm definitely not answering that one. <laughs> uh, Lord Justice Arnold doesn't like the judgment of the CJU in Mitsubishi. So, <laughs> no, I, I think um, we do have the ability, of course, to diverge from, uh, from EU law. The, the current basis on which, as I understand it, uh, UK judges would be able to diverge from judgments of the CJU uh, it will depend upon the secondary legislation that may or may not be introduced under the 2020 Withdrawal Act. Uh, it might be the case, as it currently is, that CJU decisions are elevated, in effect, to uh, judgments of the Supreme Court, in that they can only be overturned by the Supreme Court, and also only under circumstances in which the Supreme Court itself would change one of its own uh, judgments. And I can see someone nodding, so I, I feel reassured. Um, there is provision for uh, a Secretary of State to introduce secondary legislation modifying which courts are able to depart from the CJU, uh, and it could in principle reduce it from the Supreme Court to the Court of Appeal or the High Court, uh, and also depending on the area of law too. Now, Justin um, mentioned earlier that IP is a kind of specialist area, it's got its own way of thinking, and of course has its own judges as well. Uh, and so you, you might have thought that it's the sort of area in which you might see um, permission being given to the Court of Appeal to be able to uh, depart from uh, judgments of the CJU. So I think linking this back to trademark law, the reason I, I started this by talking about Mitsubishi is because um, Arnold at a recent event in Cambridge uh, said he had this, not quite in his sights, but, but he said this was one of the judgments of the CJU that he thought was a bit bonkers. And so you wonder with his recent elevation to the Court of Appeal, whether he might like set about modifying some of those aspects. Just um, 
uh, of course, you know, there's so much that's unknown about Brexit at the moment, uh, uh, asking for an answer when it comes to trademark law as opposed to anything else, in, in, including how we get across the channel, it's, it's kind of difficult. But it, it, I just uh, uh, keep in mind that patent law is not, sorry, not part of the question, but patent law is European law, but it's not uh, EU law. You know, there's a separate convention for patent law, um, which, uh, you know, goes back to the 70s. And so that will continue as it is. And the EU have tried very hard to muscle in on that jurisprudence for a long time. And there are even patent law judgments coming out of the CJEU um, to do with certain directives, which is which um, uh, have had little impact, I think probably fair to say to date. Um, so patent law, European patent law should mostly carry on as it is there are a whole bunch of changes which may come, uh, um, which I won't go into now, but uh, uh, um, um, to do with the Central European Court and so forth. But that, that will be a different matter. But as it currently is, uh, patent law will, will, will carry on um, uh, uh, as it is, I think. Um, but, you know, who knows? <sighs> it's so difficult to know where the world is going at the moment. Um, the second question is quite, quite interesting. Um, do you consider yourself to be an IP lawyer with expertise extending over English law? So um, I wasn't quite sure, Michael, were you saying uh, English law generally or English IP law? IP law. Um, so, so, so the main... My main expertise, so it comes in degrees. So, so as a patent lawyer, I, I, I uh, learnt first English patent law, but a lot of our jurisprudence comes from the European Patent Office. And um, uh, English practitioners, to greater or lesser extents, have appeared in the European Patent Office. I probably appeared in the European Patent Office uh, 40 or 50 times, I expect. And so I very much have in mind European patent law, that's the jurisprudence of the European Patent Office. Um, that um, EPO law is also part of English law. It gets picked up in a lot, of our, uh, a lot of our cases. So I wouldn't draw much of a distinction between English law and European patent law. I'd say they're one and the same thing. Um, infringement is, of course, dealt with by national states and there's a so that's validity for patents sorry so when one's talking about it infringement um, um there's more divergence and um a lot of the cases we do will be litigated in a number of european jurisdictions so typically if it's a big case you're being litigated in the states also be being litigated they typically pick off a few jurisdictions very common patent would be the UK, Germany, the Netherlands, and maybe France and the US. That would be quite a, quite a common pattern. And of course, you pick up, uh, I wouldn't call it expertise, but a measure of experience of what goes in, on in these other European jurisdictions in terms of process and the way they approach uh, litigation. And you pick up a little bit of US law. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't call that expertise. But in terms of the central... Uh, European law and validity of IP rights. Uh, I think we'd all, 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 you know, have got a fair bit of uh, experience right across Europe, a fair bit of expertise for the whole of uh, uh, Europe. Um, practice how you actually do things in European countries in terms of engaging the the courts. That, that's a different matter. I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't know how to persuade a French judge or how to issue a claim in France or. What are the best tactics in France or which arguments may appeal to particular tribunals? I think that's more more specialist area and I wouldn't claim to have any expertise in that. Michael, I'm not sure if that really, does that, is that your question or was it? No, that's right. Thank you for the response, sir. Um, so we're moving to our last question, which is, has IP been impacted by current circumstances with COVID-19? Uh, 
in terms of amount of work, I, I, I don't have a great feel for that. I've had a couple of cases which I've been working on, uh, big cases, and so I haven't been looking for more things. I don't have a feel for whether uh, people feel they're less busy than they were. I don't know whether Justin or Thomas... Yeah, so, so, I mean, uh, uh, obviously the question can be taken at different levels. In terms of the amount of work that's been going on, I think... Um, it was a bit slow, not necessarily for individual people, but working on existing cases. But I think in terms of new actions being initiated um, between April and July, it was relatively few. Um, 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 in terms of, um, and, and I think that's picked up since, by the way, I think we're now sort of, you know, actions are being initiated. So I think there was a bit of a, a bit of a window. What happens going forward again, I think we can only really, guess in, in all aspects of our life. Um, I, I, it's of course had a big effect on how we conducted hearings. So we did, um, the IP courts are quite progressive generally, and they, right from the get go, they said, right, we'll do hearings online. Um, and so we had hearings, you know, from our offices or from our homes with the judge at his home. Um, and that started. Um, and then there were a few trials so then with the trial, obviously different to just a, uh, an application, you've got witnesses uh, and the judge needs to sort of ideally see the witnesses. And so we then have hit our stride with what's called hybrid trials. So there'll be a limit to the number of people allowed to attend in court. Uh, witnesses will be in court, barristers in court, the judge in court, um, but the client's probably not. Witness, if the witness is in the US, there'll be video linked in, which always happened occasionally, but is perhaps happening more often. So these sort of hybrid trials, and then those hybrid trials more recently have been impacted by the fact the judge then discovers that his, you know, his, his second son has to, have a, has to have a test. So that means he has to self-isolate. So he's, he's actually not in the court either. Um, so it's been a bit of a, uh, a mishmash, um, but, Generally, we've been getting on with it um, as best we can in the circumstances. Um, and the wheels of uh, justice are turning, perhaps slightly imperfectly, but, but turning nevertheless. Um, so I think that's every question that we've got ready and is in the chat. So um, I just wanted to say thank you to Lika firstly for asking all the questions questions um, and thank you for everyone to, um, that came um, but I also want to say a massive thank you to all of our panellists your answers were really can I just say one other thing helpful. sorry very rudely um, that's all yeah, that's fine. can I just say one other thing just because you're all here uh, and um, if I was in your position and thinking of going to become a barrister whether it's IP or another area I think one has to be realistic and recognise that it's quite difficult to get a place in a set of chambers. Uh, and all of us who've arrived, there are a few people who are head and shoulders above the other applicants. But most of us, I think there's been an element of luck in, in whether you get a place in chambers. Um, I wouldn't of itself discourage you from going down that route, but I would say keep an open mind as to where you're going to end up. So. You know, having a law degree, I think, is very useful. Um, and uh, I'd approach it with enthusiasm and ambition, but an appreciation that you may well end up being in-house in a, in, a, in, um, in a company, which could be like super interesting, being the in-house lawyer in a biotech startup, or you might end up working in a firm of solicitors. And... Um, I'd be looking at all those possibilities and continue looking at all those possibilities for the first five years of your career and not be, you know, try not to be hugely disappointed if you don't end up in a top set of, uh, of chambers because, you know, that's life, that's the way it is. And, um, and there are very few places and some years there's huge competition some years there's much less competition and with a good science degree you'll fly in and um, just keep a very open mind as to where you, where you end up. But I think whatever you do, having a science degree, good science degree and a law degree, I mean, by that I mean the year's conversion, 
I think really, you know, puts you in a promising position for the jobs market generally. Um, I'd be very interested to know if sort of Charles and, and, and Thomas have any views on that, because it is, you know... Yeah, I mean, I def definitely keeping, keeping options open is really important um, because you, you just don't know. Uh, you don't know how it's going to work out. And I, I completely agree on the element of, of luck point. And I definitely looked at other other jobs and, and quite a few different types of jobs where... Uh, both the science and the law come in useful, maybe maybe, maybe to differing extents, uh, but they're both degrees which show that you've got useful skills to offer. I'd agree with all of that, um, absolutely. You know, having a having a STEM background plus law degree um, are, are both very useful qualifications, uh, and absolutely, and I think an element of luck is required. Um, for, for many jobs that, that people apply for, and, and you just hope that your, your luck wins out on, on one of them. Um, I, I met up with a friend on you know, the weekend, and he had this big, his, his, we were sort of comparing, you know, what the two of us have done um, with school friends since, since school. Uh, he's just finished his uh, PhD, uh, and he's been working for some time at the Alan Turing Institute, uh, and has just started um, a startup to do with uh, coding recently. And, and his big sort of idea that he had was all about spending a number of years investing in what he called his his capital, just you know gaining a lot of skills and experience and exposure to the kinds of people who are you know very good at the kinds of things that he wants to uh, go into. Um, and I think as both Justin and Charles say, uh, having those kind of qualifications and keeping an open mind uh, is is a very profitable and, and fruitful way forwards. And and I'd also say don't be in a hurry to do your law straight away uh, I mean you know if you're sort of humming and hiring whether to do a master's or a PhD um, and thinking well I don't know I may, may have missed missed my chance to be a lawyer I, I completely disagree with that I think actually you know more science is better than uh, and just an undergraduate degree in terms of going forward uh, if you find it that that's that's tempting uh, and um, you know I came to the bar when I was in my late 20s I don't, there's any, you know, if you're doing it at 40, it may be a lot more challenging, but doing this conversion course in, in your late 20s is absolutely fine. That won't be a disadvantage at all. Um, and um, we've had a lot of people be very successful at the bar coming coming around about the age of so 29, 30. And in some ways that gives you, perhaps gives you a, a bigger advantage. Um, so uh, again, don't be, don't feel you have to rush it. Um, thank you for that. That's really useful, not only for our STEM students, but for all of our non-law students as well. Um, I just wanted to put a quick reminder for everyone for our scholarship event that we've got on the 21st of October. Um, I'm just going to put the link um, in the chat box now to RSV or, um, RSVP or place. Um, so we hope to see you all there. Um, again, thank you to all of our panellists. It was a really informative chat. Um, and yeah, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed the evening. Thank, thank you very you. much for inviting us. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Thank you.